Thank you very much. I will try to briefly outline just, I think, two major points related to Russia and its future role for uh, the European security. First is, uh, when I talk to many Westerners, it seems that there is an illusion uh, that the recent aggressive and expansionist behavior of Russia is only linked to the aspirations of one man, Vladimir Putin. So the popular perception is that one day, and definitely this will happen, and we will see it in our lifetime, uh, Vladimir Putin will be gone, step down from power in Russia, and things will go back to normal merely automatically. I have to say that unfortunately things are far more complicated than that. Uh, my major point is that Vladimir Putin did not invent the idea which I think became a major idea of Russian domestic and international policy during uh, or a decade and a half of Vladimir Putin's rule, which is establishing Russian dominance over the post-Soviet space, which I think so many conflicts with the West, uh, so many difficulties on the international uh, political arena has been uh, related just to that Russian aspiration, dominance over post-Soviet space. Putin, as a matter of fact, did not invent this. Uh, in, in the early 2000s, even in the late 90s, there were clear signs that many people in the Russian establishment actually wanted uh, to pursue uh, acquisition of strategic economic assets uh, in, in the so-called near abroad, and through that uh, opt for increasing Russian political influence there. I think it was first uh, most clearly formulated in public by Anatoly Chubais in 2003, who gave a speech and wrote an article called Liberal Empire, which was a very, very uh, hot uh, discussion uh, topic in Russia back in 2003, the last relatively free uh, parliamentary elections, uh, which uh, basically Vladimir Putin at the time being was very much lagging behind this uh, public discourse. There was a huge demand from the, uh, uh, even the so-called liberal part of the Russian establishment that uh, one way Russia can become stronger is by incorporating everything around it, uh, which, is, which is much weaker, which is kind of a business uh, look at, at uh, things. So uh, I think uh, you got to understand that this uh, imperialist drive, expansionist drive, is far more deep-rooted than just being associated with uh, one personality of Putin, and it will take a very serious effort to cure that. Uh, obviously, there will always be a battle of two camps inside Russia. One camp, which I think I and my colleagues tend to represent, which treats uh, neighboring states as sovereign states, as equals, and this is how we should build relations with them, respecting their sovereignty, their European aspirations, and, and so on. But there is the other camp, and you would not imagine how many uh, relatively reasonable people who do not like the current Russian regime, do not like corruption, who want free elections, who want probably Putin gone, but uh, these people still think that, you know, these neighboring states are not real states. So this is finally should become something ours. There are many people like that. I'm sure... Uh, you in the European Union uh, know this problem pretty well because you do have a lot of states which experienced uh, severe post-imperial syndrome in the past. So you gotta understand that this problem is systemic and it should be addressed as systemic and not just affiliated with one uh, personality no matter how bad. So I think one way uh, in terms of advice on how to cure that, uh, I think one way which is very important and should be absolutely addressed is make this post-Soviets, help make this post-Soviet space states a success. I think there has not been, unfortunately, many achievements here. Right now, I have been talking to my uh, friends at the European People's Party this morning. Uh, we met at their headquarters, and uh, we had been discussing Moldova, uh, a government, a string of governments which we consider to be pro-European, being in power for six consecutive years, largest largest EU per capita assistance in the whole uh, neighboring uh, European neighborhood and and so what where are the results where are the successful reforms which could have already made significant uh, progress of Moldova uh, moving towards becoming a, a prosperous free democratic uh, European country 
Ukraine, uh, we see that two years, uh, of course, there are, I understand all about the difficulties. I used to work in the Russian government as a reformer. You don't have to tell me about the difficulties. Uh, I know all about them. But two years after Maidan, uh, tax reduction, privatization, demonopolization, question is, where is the progress in all that France? I mean, this cannot be justified with war in Donbass and with Russian aggression. Uh, some progress should have happened over this, this uh, period of time. It's been sufficient period of time to at least make some decisive steps. I think it is very important for Europe to understand that the crucial uh, issue which can help bring about uh, uh, a different view in Russia, uh, a, a view that neighbor states are, are, are equals and sovereign nations that should be treated with respect, it completely depends on success of reforms in your neighborhood, which I think obviously uh, there has not been uh, done enough in this regard. So I just my best advice is to keep focusing on it and help make these states uh, prosper and reform themselves. And the second point, obviously, is sanctions. Uh, I hear, to my surprise, uh, from many people in the West saying that sanctions against Russia are not working. Uh, there is a common wisdom which says that uh, difficulties in the Russian economy are mostly associated with decline in the price of oil. This has nothing to do with reality. Price of oil, surprisingly as it may sound, doesn't mean much. Because in the oil industry, we have very low costs, two, three dollars lifting costs on the wellhead. And we have a progressive taxation, which means everything about 40 bucks per barrel goes to the budget. Companies do not see this hundred dollar oil. And the budget keeps it spending. The, the, well, there was no reduction in, in budget spending. They just keep spending the reserve fund, which is already there. The trade balance was still positive. So why was the ruble collapse and all this depreciation of uh, income? Because Russian companies and banks became overly dependent on Western private credit, and that became unavailable after financial sanctions. The shrinking of credit portfolio in just a year and a half since July 1st was $200 billion. They had to repay in foreign debt, in private foreign debt. And they are not able to borrow anymore. Essentially, Russia is finding itself in an international credit blockade. So whoever tells you that sanctions have no impact doesn't understand anything about how Russian economy works. It is the one and only factor which had brought down uh, Russian consuming purchasing power to a record lows compared to in, in, in 20 years uh, I think we're talking about the worst crisis since the collapse of the USSR. So yes, they are working. Big question is, uh, another uh, people ask a uh, question, did the sanctions influence the change in Vladimir P Putin's policy? Yes, they did. They stopped direct military intervention in Ukraine. We saw assaults on Mariupol and we saw major introduction of uh, Russian troops in August 2014, in the beginning of 2015. Uh, ultimately, this will stop direct military intervention, large scale in Ukraine is off the agenda. It's a big deal to make this uh, issue work further and have uh, impact in actual reverse of policies. But I would argue that people who are saying that sanctions have no impact are wrong. Thank you. Uh, the potential attack on the Baltic states. Uh, frankly speaking, I don't think it's a realistic option right now because Putin is very much contained by a lot of factors. Uh, economics is, play, is playing an important role here, uh, and the dire economic situation that he finds himself, uh, including the impact uh, of Western sanctions. So I think it's not a realistic uh, option. However, having said that, uh, there is one important lesson from the Crimea annexation. In terms of security, you cannot leave open ends. If you just have an open space absolutely unprotected, and if it's just take like 48 hours to take it militarily with no major resistance. The, we have people in Kremlin who already did that. Uh, so if they feel like there are open ends in their neighborhood, there is a chance that at some point uh, they can do it again. So 
it's not good to leave open ends. That's, that's an important point. In terms of what can be done to stimulate reforms, I think, you know, I have been very closely observing these uh, efforts to, to help those uh, European neighboring states uh, to reform themselves. There was always this situation like some uh, establishment, new establishment comes which says we are pro-European, we made European choice, and there you go, all these generous releases of funding, uh, advisors, and all that stuff. There's been, after some uh, uh, a recent surge of disappointment with lack of reforms in Ukraine, there's been a very good headline in Kiev Post newspaper which said, no reforms, no aid. Plain and simple as that. I think it should be demonstrated very clearly, but uh, apart from that stick, there should also be a carrot because uh, like, I, I consider uh, a transformation of Eastern Europe, the post-communist transformation, is a very successful modernization example in general. And I think key factor which was driving this uh, uh, and, and stimulating elites to actually work and not just talk was the perspective of EU accession. So the lack of this realistic perspective, you know, makes it all really a devalued effort to begin with, right? So apart from the stick, you should also have a carrot. I understand that there's a sort of saturation with, with uh, accession and new members, but these reformers in these countries really become demotivated once this accession perspective is lacking. I think it's very, very obvious, uh, so you should think about that. And uh, to conclude, the, the, the optimism and perspective. Indeed, Russia will inevitably become a European democratic state. Just do not think that this will be easy and fast. It's, you know, Russia is a complicated country. It's a big rusty wheel, very difficult to turn around. Uh, we're uh, often talking of like binary black and white terms. Either it's Putin's dictatorship or it collapses and overnight uh, we have uh, open democratic government. No, it won't be simple as that. It's going to be gradual, difficult, would take a lot of time, a lot of effort. Unfortunately, I think many uh, bad things might happen along the way, but we're committed to stay on course and transform Russia into a modern European democratic state and I think you probably saw that commitment from my colleagues speaking today.